The following is a presentation of Chandler Christian Church in Chandler, Arizona. For more information, please go to chandlercc.org. It's broad daylight on a busy high street and a brazen smash and grab robbery is in progress. The six men are using sledgehammers to try and break their way into a jeweler shop. Three of the gang are on scooters ready for a quick getaway. Panic shop staff have hit the alarm and the shutters are coming down but the men are still managing to try and grab expensive watches and jewellery. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, something astonishing happens. Look closely at the right hand side of your screen. The figure we've highlighted is a pensioner. She's seen what's going on and is storming towards the gang armed only with her handbag. Alone she confronts the robbers. The beaten gang decide enough is enough and try their getaway. But one falls off his scooter and at this point the fearless pensioner is joined by members of the public, including the cameraman who shot this footage. One gang member is restrained, while the pensioner is comforted by incredulous onlookers. Wow. What an amazing video. That, that lady is a hero. But did, did you notice how many people just stood around and watched this break-in going in? I mean, how they were stealing things. It was brazen daylight robbery. People everywhere. Somebody's even shooting cell phone video of it and did nothing. They didn't do a thing. Why? Well, because they didn't want to get involved. And, and because what was being stolen wasn't theirs, so it really didn't matter to them. But not this lady. This lady saw it, and, 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 and it mattered to her because stealing is wrong. Stealing is wrong. According to the National Association of Shoplifting Prevention, which, by the way, I didn't even know there was such a thing, but uh, anyway, according to the National Association of Shoplifting Prevention, shoplifting is a 13 billion, that's million with a B, 13 billion dollar problem in America today. Amazing. Let me share with you some, sun, some uh, fun facts about shoplifting. Uh, you can see if you can help me out here. Uh, first of all, what is the percentage of Americans who shoplift? Is it 1 in 11, 1 in 17, or 1 in 21? What do you think? What's the answer? 17. 1 in 17? 1 in 11. The correct answer is 1 in 11. 1 in 11 of Americans say that they have shoplifted. Number two, who shoplifts more, men or women? Now be careful here, okay? There is a wrong answer, and there is a wrong answer, all right? <laughs> So who shoplifts more, men or women? What do you think? Women. Yeah, okay. It's just about right. 49 to 51%, almost even. I won't tell you which one is 51. <laughs> All right. <laughs> who shoplifts more, adults or children? Adults. Adult children, I hear of both. Uh, the answer is uh, adults. It's about three to one, actually, of adults who shoplift over children. Is most shoplifting premeditated or spontaneous? Spontaneous, or 73% is spontaneous. Now, you, you hear about these gangs that go in and shoplift, but they're pretty rare. It's mostly just spontaneous. And, and the interesting thing about it is most shoplifters buy something at the same time as they shoplift. You know, I mean, they're, they're buying something, they're going out and checking out, but they've got something they've stolen in their pocket. It's amazing. Uh, what is the most shoplifted or stolen book? What do you think it is? The Bible, yeah. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> that is the Bible. Hey, if you, if you need one, don't steal it. We'll give you one, okay? We want you to have one. And, and, and guess, guess who ultimately pays for the shoplifting loss? We do. That's right, you do. You know, you say it's not, it's a victim, it's not a victimless. The, the stores get insurance, yes, but, but they raise their prices to cover that cost, and then we pay for that which is stolen. And if you think a $13 billion is bad for annual shoplifting theft, white collar theft, according to the University of Connecticut School of Business, white collar theft is estimated to be a $300 billion loss in America annually. So God just cuts to the chase on this one. He just makes it very simple. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, he says this, you shall not steal. Short and sweet, right to the point, 
This app is just real because stealing is just wrong. It's just wrong. And it affects everyone. And, and the fact is that it deteriorates society when we lose personal property and values. And it really says a lot about our hearts. And this is so true with all of these life apps that we've been talking about. God gives them to us so that we might live that full and satisfying life. And, and when we apply them, it makes all the difference in the world. In fact, let's remind ourselves of these life apps or these Ten Commandments. Would you do so and honor God as we read His Word? Stand with me and let me read for you. I'm going to ask you to join me and just read verse 15. I'll read the rest of it. But uh, listen to what God says. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or above or the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who texts OMG, I'm sorry, uh, who misuses the name, his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor maidservant, nor the animals, nor the aliens that live within your gate. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit murder. Here we go. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. A few years ago, when gas prices started shooting up, uh, Dennis Quigley and his family uh, drove their RV to a campground outside of Seattle, Washington. And um, in the middle of the night, uh, Dennis woke up to hearing some strange sounds behind his RV. So armed with his baseball bat and a flashlight, he went out the door quietly, and when he walked around to the back of his RV, he saw a young man curled up on the ground, retching, throwing up violently. This young man was trying to steal gas and siphon it out of the gas tank, but instead of putting the siphon hose into the gas tank, he inadvertently put the siphon hose into the sewage tank. Yeah. When the police arrived, both the Quigleys and the police felt like he'd paid enough for what he had done in his theft. In Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado, uh, a robber went into a convenience store with a shotgun and asked for money. And while the clerk was putting money into a bag, he noticed a bottle of scotch on the shelf behind her and said, throw that bottle of scotch in as well. To which the clerk said, I can't do that unless I know that you're over 21. So the thief pulled out his driver's license and handed it to her, proving that he was over 21 years of age. When she called the police, she gave the location, and within two hours, the man was arrested in his apartment. <laughs> in New York City, <clears throat> um, if you have a pet and the pet passes away, uh, you just can't put it in a dumpster, and you certainly can't bury it in that concrete jungle. And uh, so they have a service provided by the city. It's called Pet Disposal Service. And uh, for $75, they'll take your dead pet and take care of it. So one enterprising soul came up with a better idea. She posted in the local newspaper that she would dispose of dead pets for $40. Good savings. And this was her process. She would go to the house where the pet had died. She would determine the size of the pet. And then she would go to a thrift store and buy a bag or a briefcase that would fit the size of the animal. She then would take the dead animal inside of the bag to the park or to the subway station or to the bus station, set it down beside her on a bench, and then inadvertently pretend that she was reading the newspaper for 15 or 20 minutes. When she looked up, the bag would have been gone. And the poor thief opened it up to find he got more than he bargained for when he stole from her. Now, you may listen to these and say, you yeah, know, that's not me, though, honestly. 
Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with this stealing thing. But the truth is that stealing or taking what doesn't belong to us is really in the heart of every person. If you don't think that is true, go volunteer in our nursery ministry and watch the toddlers play with each other. When one two-year-old grabs a toy and is playing with it and having a great time, another toddler will see that and inadvertently walk over to where that child is and with intention grab that toy and take it away from the one that's playing with it. Because there's a little theft, there's a little stealing in the heart of every person. It seems to be inborn in us that we want what we don't have. We want what someone else has. And we struggle with this. So what does stealing look like? Well, barring from a popular comedian, you might be stealing if you shoplift or take what doesn't belong to you. You might be stealing if you shoplift or take what doesn't belong to you. Very simple. You, you take that, that uh, thing, you buy, take that uh, pack of gum, you take that, and you do it with intention. You shoplift or you steal. Heard about a man one time, his wife called him and said, Honey, we've got to fire our maid. And he said, Why? And he, she said, Well, because I think she's stealing our towels. And he said, which towels are those? And she said, the ones we took from Holiday Inn. <laughs> Somehow we just don't think it relates to us. And the fact is that that is stealing. You might be stealing if you uh, shoplift or take what doesn't belong to you. You might be stealing if you're guilty of employee theft. If you're guilty of employee theft. In the book, The Day America Told the Truth, it showed some shocking facts about how we operate, what our values and our morals and our ethics are in our country today. In that book, they state that the average employee said that they spent 20% of their time goofing off at work. Over 50% surveyed said that they called in sick on occasions when they were not sick, except sick of work. Other employees told of coming in late, leaving early, taking extended breaks, spending more time on lunch hour than verified, falsifying their time card, making personal calls when not allowed at work, surfing on the internet, checking their Facebook status, lying on expense accounts, and using office supplies that they were not authorized to use for personal use. It's funny, this is my third time through this message, and it always gets real quiet right here. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 11, verse 18 says, A wicked man earns deceptive wages. And, and if you are guilty of employee theft, you might be stealing. You might be stealing if you don't pay a fair wage. We go from the employee to the employer. James 5, 4 says, Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. If you don't pay a fair wage, or if you don't pay everybody that they're due, or if you're slow in paying the bills, then you might be stealing. You might be stealing if you use things without permission. If you use things without permission, you might be stealing. If you make a copy of that CD your friend has because you like the music on it, and you're not going to sell it. In fact, all you want to do is put it on your iPod. But if you make a copy of it illegally, you might be stealing. Or that movie... Well, it's not even that great of a movie. I don't want to buy it. You might be stealing. Or if you used unlicensed software on your computer. Or, or if you use copyrighted material without approval and permission. You might be stealing. You might be stealing if you intentionally deceive. If you intentionally deceive. If you sell something without full disclosure, well, I think I got it fixed. I hope I got it fixed. The window's been going up and down lately, so I guess it's okay. If you cheat on a test, you're taking a test and, and you're cheating on it. You're, you're borrowing answers from a neighbor or someone else. You've got them written down on your hand, and you're cheating on a test. You're deceiving the teachers who are giving the instruction. You might be stealing if you intentionally deceive. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 23 says, The Lord detests differing weights and dishonest scales. Do not please him. 
I, I remember an old Norman Rockwell painting. How many of you know who Norman Rockwell is, okay? A great American artist. And, uh, uh, and he, in one of his paintings, it shows a scene at a butcher store. And uh, in that scene, uh, there's a piece of meat on the scale. And the people, the man and the, uh, the butcher and the woman are arguing. And uh, if you look carefully, you can see that as they're arguing, that the butcher's thumb is on the scale tray, pushing down, adding weight to the meat that's being weighed. And if you look even more carefully, you'll see that the woman who's arguing with the butcher has her finger underneath that scale, <laughs> lifting it up to lessen the weight of the meat that's being weighed. If you intentionally deceive, you might be stealing. You might be stealing if you improperly leech off of others. If you improperly leech off of others, you might be stealing. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 24 says, He who robs his father and mother and says, It's not wrong. He is a partner to him who destroys. Listen, if, if, if you're old enough and capable of living outside the home, and, and if you're just living with your parents and you're not paying rent, not paying your, fa- you're paying your fair way as you do so, and you're leeching off your parents, you're stealing from them. And the same thing would be true if you are a parent or an older person and you're just living off of your children instead of paying your fair way, you might be leeching off of them. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. If you're fully capable of working at a job, any job of making a living wage, of making a wage to care for yourself, and instead of working, you're living off the government, who is us, then you might be stealing. You might be stealing if you plagiarize. It's a problem that preachers often have, or sometimes if you're writing reports or papers, borrowing the words of another's improperly, taking the credit for something someone else has said. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 30 says, Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another's words, supposedly from me. Preachers struggle with this. You might be stealing if you take a product back after using it for a refund. I've heard people talk about this. In the world that we live in where uh, customer service is such a huge deal, a lot of the companies, are, our stores are really liberal in terms of return policy. And I know of people who have bought things and used them and then taken them back for an in-store credit or a full refund. And if you're guilty of that, if you're taking a product back after using it and then for a refund, you might be stealing. Mark 10, verse 19, Jesus said, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. And do not defraud. And if you purchase something and then taken it back for a refund, that's defrauding. You might be stealing. You might be stealing if you cheat on your taxes. You know, I don't like all the things that our government does with our tax money. But, you know, if I don't like that, then I need to vote and change the government. That's how that works. But I need to pay my taxes because that's what God says. In Romans chapter 13, verse 7, the apostle says, Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. You say, well, but everybody's doing it. Everybody's fudging. Everybody's cheating. Everybody's not doing the full report. Well, just because everybody's doing this doesn't mean it's right. It's wrong to steal. And you might be stealing if you don't tithe to God's work. If you don't give that 10% as God has instructed us to in the Scriptures, if you're not tithing, you might be stealing from God. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, God says, Will a man rob God? And yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? And God says, in tithes and offerings. We don't. Don't give as God wants us to do. Then we are stealing from God. You might be stealing. So so I hope that I've managed to convince you that this stealing thing is far more widespread than we might like to think that it is. And that we are far more culpable than we would ever like to admit that we are when it comes to stealing. So why is this so tempting to us? Why is it even mentioned in the scripture? Why does God seal so critical that it's listed in that top 10 of his commandments for us. Well, there are two reasons I think that we're tempted to steal. The first is because we are not content, because we are not content people. We see what somebody else has, or we don't have something that we want. 
or we see what somebody else has got and we want it. And so we will do anything within our power to get it from them because we're not content. Now, this gets to the heart of coveting. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But let me share a verse with you. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, the Apostle Paul says this. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be, what's the word? Content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being, what's the word? Content Content in any, every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now, Paul says that I've learned the secret of being content. Therefore, contentment is not natural. Natural is that toddler who takes the toy away from somebody else. So if we are going to be content, it is a learned behavior. And that's what God wants us to do. And how do we learn that? Well, the second way that we're tempted to steal is because we simply do not trust God. We just don't trust God. This is the real reason that we steal. Because we're not sure that God will give us all that we want. We're not sure God will meet all of our needs, and so we don't trust Him. So we take it upon ourselves to meet those needs. Several years ago, there was a movie out called The Cinderella Man. And in this movie, in the clip I want to show you, um, it's couched in the Depression era in New York City. And in this movie, the young boy in the family has stolen a salami from a local butcher shop. And uh, he's found out by his mother. And um, she disciplines the young boy and says, wait till your father gets home. And so when dad gets home, she tells him what the boy has done. And he takes step to correct it. But as you watch this clip, I want you to really carefully listen to why this boy says that he took the salami. The reason the boy took what didn't belong to him is because he was afraid. He was insecure and afraid that his father would not be able to provide what was necessary for him. And because of that insecurity, he took what didn't belong to him. And the same thing is true with us. The source of stealing is when we just don't trust God. In fact, it's interesting that in this chapter, the fourth chapter, where the apostle teaches us to to learn the secret of being content, he tells us how to learn it. And he simply says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, "And, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say meet all your wants. And he may not meet all your needs the way you think he'll meet all your needs, but you can trust him. He'll never send you away. So don't steal. You shall not steal. Just trust him. It'll be okay. So how can we avoid stealing? Well, we can avoid stealing, first of all, by realizing that God is watching us. You need to realize that God is watching. Have you noticed any more that when somebody steals something, there's always a camera on them? Whether it's a camera at a convenience store or gas station or a camera, someone's cell phone camera or there's a camera at the ATM across the street or there's a camera uh, out on the street somewhere that's shooting photo, there, that there's always somebody who's watching. There's always someone who is seen. I heard about a, a man who went into a bank one day and pulled back his jacket showing his gun and said, uh, handed a note that said, put all your money in a bag and hand it to me. And so uh, as she was loading uh, the money into the bag, she looked up. And when the burglar or the thief looked up, she said, smile, stupid. They're taking your picture. (laughs) Now, I don't suggest that, okay? (laughs) But the reality is when you take from somebody, somebody's watching. In fact, God is watching. Proverbs 5.21 says, for a man's ways are in what kind of view? Full view of God. He sees every time that you uh, make that fudge on that income tax statement or that financial report or when you take that candy bar off the shelf. He, He sees, he observes. So we can avoid stealing by realizing that God is watching and by recognizing that you reap what you sow. We need to recognize that we reap what we sow. There's no honor among thieves. And eventually, it will be The price will be paid. It will be discovered. If not by anyone here on earth, it will be discovered by God. Paul says in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be made fun of or mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And we can avoid stealing when we remember to live with integrity. That we choose to live with integrity. 
Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something youthful with his own hands so they may have something to share with those who are in need. So remember to live with integrity. Just stop it. Stop stealing. Stop taking what doesn't belong to you. Just say no. But my friends, just say no. But everybody, just say no. But it's so easy. Just say no. And stop it and live with integrity. We can avoid stealing when we realize that we need to make restitution for what we've stolen. The Bible makes this inherently plain throughout the Scriptures. In fact, in Exodus chapter 22, just two chapters after what we just read from, Exodus chapter 20 and the Ten Commandments, just two chapters later in Exodus 22 verse 3, Moses writes, A thief must certainly make restitution, but if he has nothing, he must be sold to pay for his theft. Now look at that verse again. Moses said that if if somebody steals something from somebody then he needs to make restitution for what he's stolen. But if he's used it all and there's nothing left, then he himself must be sold into slavery in order to pay off what he had taken. Does this not show us the seriousness of God on this issue of you shall not steal? And there are multiple scriptures that state this all over, that we need to make restitution. Do you remember one day when Jesus was walking through the city of uh, of, uh, um, um, Jericho, and he was along the road that there was a tax collector whose name was Zacchaeus, who wanted to see Jesus, but he was a short guy, identify, and he couldn't see Jesus because of the crowd. And so he climbs up in a tree to see Jesus, and as Jesus walks by, uh, Jesus sees him and says, Zacchaeus, come on down, I'm going to go to your house tonight for a dinner party. So Zacchaeus invites all of his friends and they come to the dinner party and he is so changed, such a changed man after meeting Jesus that he comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, if I have inadvertently cheated anyone out of tax money, I will pay them back four times what I've taken from them. Where did that come from? Well, in the Old Testament it says if you've stolen from someone, if you've cheated someone, then you need to restore it four times. But what if you did so intentionally? Well, the Old Testament is playing on that. It says if you've intentionally cheated someone, you need to make restitution up to seven times what you've taken from them. God is very plain on this issue. We can avoid stealing by making restitution of what we've stolen. I heard about a man one day who uh, sent a letter to the Internal Revenue Service. And um, the letter uh, stated this. uh, Dear IRS, two years ago I cheated on my taxes and I just can't sleep at night. So I'm enclosing a $100 check on the taxes that I cheated on. And if I can't sleep anymore, I'll send you the rest of what I owe. (laughs) Well, it's a start. Okay, it's a start. How can we avoid stealing? Well, repent of the wrong that you've done. Repent of the wrong that you've done. To repent means to turn. Not just stop, but turn. Turn from sin and turn to the Savior. You know, as we've talked about what it means and how we might be stealing, I think all of us look in our own lives and go, oops. And we all realize that we're guilty of it. So what do we do about that sin in our lives? Well, the answer is turn from the sin and turn to the Savior. Isaiah 55 verse 7 says this, Let the wicked forsake his way and then the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God. For he will freely, what? Pardon. Pardon. Amen. And when Jesus was on his cross, God took all of the stealing that I have done, that we have done. And he piled the blame and the guilt for all of us on the shoulders of his son, our Savior. And when Jesus cried out those final words on the cross... It is finished. Or teleestai. Or paid in full. He paid and made restitution for that which we have done. So turn from sin and turn it over to the Savior. Now, can I share with you one last major reason? while stealing is so wrong. 
And that is because stealing dishonors God. This is especially true for a Christ follower. Stealing dishonors God. In Proverbs chapter 30, in the context of being poor and asking God to provide our needs for us, the proverb writer says, Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. When we take what doesn't belong to us, even when we think that no one knows, God is dishonored. His name, His authority, His right is dishonored. In fact, Paul writes in Titus chapter 2, verse 10, And do not steal, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. When you steal and someone finds out about it, and finds out that you call yourself a follower of Christ, and then you try to share Christ with them, they go, I want nothing to do with your brand of Christianity. Because you've dishonored the name. Of God. And God says it very plainly. You shall not steal. In September of 1990, Danny Simpson of Ottawa, Canada, uh, walked into a, um, a, a bank and using a gun, he robbed that bank and was uh, tried and given six years of imprisonment for robbing a bank of $6,000. The pistol he used was given to him by his father who had it given to him by his father who had it given to him by his father. It was an antique gun, a Colt 45. In fact, this Colt 45, after they arrested Danny and the police confiscated the weapon, they noticed that the gun uh, was unique. In fact, the gun was a, a collector's item. It was made under contract by the Ross Rifle Company during World War I, and it was one of only 100 Colt 45s made by this company. The estimate was that the value of the gun that he used to rob the bank of $6,000, that the value of the weapon was approximately $100,000. He used a $100,000 gun that was his possession, to rob a bank of $6,000. Simpson simply could have walked into any gun shop and sold the pistol for at least 1,500 times the amount that he stole from the bank, for which he is spending years in jail. See, he was willing to steal something cheap without realizing the value of what he had. And when we choose to steal, we do the same. God says it very plainly. You shall not steal. But that's your decision. What will you decide today? Will you pray with me?